scripture message for today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out with a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come and gather for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together, to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. And with this signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. And the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father, these are your words and they are eternal and they are true. We pray and ask today that you would sanctify us with this word, opening up our hearts to receive it and that we can live by them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of people think Revelation is just a line of events, one following the other. Each one of these chapters is a lens looking at the end of the world from a different perspective, a different lens, a different view. But really, almost all of it describing the same thing. In this particular view, it is the looking at the white rider. And this white rider, in our first point, is the white rider and his name. Throughout Scripture, God is given so many different names. It's fascinating. And it is by his names that we learn things about the character and the quality of God and aspects of who he is. Remember, uh, God is God and we are not. We would know nothing about God at all were it not for the fact that he reveals himself to us. The Bible tells us that he reveals who he is by what has been created. But the aspects of his character and who he is are often revealed to us by his name. Now in this summary, this little small portion of scripture, just a few names are given and there's a long list of names and obviously we won't be looking at those today. But let's look at these names that are used in this text. This white writer is called, and I'm going to break it up, Faithful. He is called Faithful. I cannot be faithful, no matter how hard I want to be. There's always something I've left undone, something I maybe even forgot to do, some case where I've said one thing and then I do another. But in this world, this is something that's very hard to find, if not impossible. Someone who is faithful. But Jesus, the white rider, is faithful. He keeps his word. He fulfills his obligations. He is someone who does not fail. He is faithful. He is true. This also is really something. Truth. Sometimes it's very hard to come by. There's a lot of reasons people tell untruths. Sometimes fear motivates them to tell an untruth. Sometimes it's the intent to be deceitful, to gain something. 
Other times, it is just part of the character. And in particular, I would submit to you that even this chapter is an example of the truth of God. The whole subject of death is often, you hear it over and over. I was again at a funeral this week where people discussing why do bad things happen. The Bible tells us why. For all are under a curse. Adam and Eve sinned and all, A-L-L, all are under a curse. Everyone will die, get sick, be injured, car crash, heart attack, cancer, whatever it will be, all. Why do people die? The answer is not, who needs a God like that? That's not the answer. The answer is, Adam has sinned and brought a curse upon all mankind. That is the truth of the Bible. Jesus walked on the earth and said, in this world you will have trouble. He tells us the truth. And then Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but by me. So then we must decide. Well, I know he said that, but I'm going to try this other religion instead. Who are we to tell people on the other side of the world that they have to believe what we believe, or even the other side of the block? And I'll tell you what, we are not those people. We are nobody. We don't have the right to tell anybody anything. It's God who tells them. It's Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is faithful and he is true. Then he has a name and he doesn't tell us. That's interesting. So many names that he even has one that he doesn't tell us about. He has the name Word of God. And this is perhaps one of the most interesting words in this, names in this text, Word of God. He drew attention to this phrase, Word of God. You know, when we think about this chapter, the subject, the white horse coming, the end of the world, and the slaying of, of the beast and all these armies and kings, what will Jesus use? It references a sword, but if you look at the sword that's in this text, and we'll come to that in a little while, it's the Word of God. He spoke, and all creation came into existence. His Word is powerful. God's Word is not just sound. God's Word is power. And, and I think that's right. He is the Word of God. And if Jesus says, die, all those armies will die. Doesn't need to use anything. The Word of God. What's also good about that word, this name, as we think about these names, it is His Word that convicts our hearts. It, it comes into the side of us and it shows us our need to be saved. That which we call as Lutherans the law, which condemns and tears and, and rips apart any defense that we might have. This is the Word of God. It's able, the Bible tells us, able to penetrate. And you know it does. I felt the conviction. You felt the conviction. It comes from God. The Word of God. And on this, by the same token, the Word of God brings peace, hope, faith, love, as the Gospel takes away our burdens and sets us free. It isn't just information. It is living and active and powerful. It is supernatural. This isn't one plus one equals two. My mind doesn't care about information. My mind wants to do what it wants to do. It's the conviction that comes of the Holy Spirit that makes you realize, I am in trouble. I am under a curse. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That knowledge doesn't come from information. It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Then what do I do? There's nothing you can do. But call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's also something that doesn't come natural. We want to do something. I'm a good person. I do this. I do that. You're not. And neither am I. No, you can't do anything. And that's where the gospel comes. And it's so beautiful. The gospel says, it has been done. It has been done for you. Believe on this. Trust in this. That's not natural for us. So how is it that you can come to faith? Because the word of God. 
is living and active and powerful. Jesus leads us to trust in Him. That's a beautiful name. The Word of God. As He comes toward us. And then lastly, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't know how much needs to be said about this, but this is no game. There's only one King. There's only one Lord. And His name is Jesus. And all other kings, even though in this chapter they all gather thinking they can defeat Him, there is no one who is King of kings and Lord of lords but Jesus Christ. That's the name He, he, he uh, bears. Let us also then look at His authority. On His head in verse 12, this white rider has many crowns. He tells His disciples shortly before His ascension into heaven that all authority has been given to Him. If we could literally look into the eyes that John mentions in verse 12, we would see that His eyes are like fire. This is a person of authority. This is a person who is coming, as we confessed earlier today, to judge the world. He is coming to make final judgment of great and small, slave and free. He is in charge. And he even has an army. An army dressed in fine linen, which ultimately describes a process by which we have been purified, covered over, given white garments to wear, And we're part of His army to be in the army of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to His disciples, You did not choose Me, but I chose you. And by faith, if we've already passed away when the Lord comes, we will be in that army. Why He needs us there, it isn't to fight. (laughs) It is to show the glory of God and the saving power of Jesus Christ the glory of His ability to have all these souls that He has saved. And then it is to witness the final battle and see His power and His authority. And lastly, that brings us to the white rider and the victory. The angel calls all the birds of the earth to come, all the carrion, because of the hard hearts of man as the beast And all the kings of the earth gather their armies together. Just another view, another lens of Armageddon from a different angle. And it tells us that these people who have been deluded, that's the sad thing. Do you see that? That in verse uh, 20, that these people have been deluded. And I'm telling you, that comes back to that very first word of truth. And there are all kinds of people on this earth telling us stuff that isn't true and telling us what you can or can't believe, especially in regard to the Bible, or Jesus, or Christianity. All these people, there's a great delusion that's taking place. And the end result is, there's going to be this massive, gigantic army, trusting in the beast and all the world leaders, to square off against the white rider, who all he has to do is speak a word As it says uh, earlier, here's where I want to draw attention to verse 15. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down nations. It's his word. You know in the New Testament how the Apostle Paul refers to Scripture as a double-edged sword. The word of God. Oh, it's sad to me. This is not something I delight in. But the beast, <clears throat> the prophet, the false image, the false prophet and the beast, the two of them will be thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And all the people, all the people who have followed them will be put to death. And God gives us a glimpse into his heart. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked think about how he created us it'll be a day of sorrow for God he wrote this chapter hoping to avoid the death of people 
If you're listening on the radio right now and you're here this morning and you walk out the door not trusting in Jesus, you are deluding yourself or someone else has deluded you. And what will happen to you? This will happen to you. Verse 21, The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves upon their flesh. That's not what God wants. That's why He warns you. And we're about to have communion. One of the most interesting things about the white rider, if you get close enough, we can see upon His glorified body the wounds of the cross. Our salvation didn't come free. It didn't come cheap. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords first came as a servant and He laid His life down. So when you hear the words, this is the body of Christ given for you, this is the blood of Christ shed for you, think about the cross. Think about what the white rider did for you before he comes riding on that white horse. That's the God who is a God of mercy. Why, God, did you let this happen? Where were you, God? Why, are you, why aren't you doing the things? Why don't you save me? Why haven't you protected me from this car accident? Why have I gotten cancer? And Jesus would stand before you with these scars on his hand and say, All day long I've held out my hands for you. I have been broken for you. I have died for you. Where am I? I'm right here. Where are you? I used to hate him. And it brings shame to me to say that. When my dad died when I was 10, I hated God. And all those years of my life wasted because the real enemy was Satan. And all that time I was hating God. Where is God? Well, He's not on the white horse right at this moment. Although the trumpets could sound before we have communion. But where is He? He's here holding out His hands asking you to come to Him. Communion, as I said, is a time of gospel for the Christian. It can also be an altar call for the first time for you to come to Christ and receive what He has done for you.